How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm fine. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for doing this, man. I really appreciate it, Jeremy. Uh, we don't really know each other. This is one of the interviews where I'm kind of flying blind, but uh, I was just walking around Art Basel and I saw this amazing painting and you were standing underneath it and I put two and two together and here we are. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Clean Break, a podcast dealing with art and business powered by Always Art. I'm your host, Matt Gondek. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's part of the magic of Basel. That's why I love it so much. It's it's you meet people that you've been looking at their work for a while, or you've been listening to their podcast for a while, and you're just like, oh shit, I I know that person. And so yeah. you feel yeah. like you know them even though you don't know them. So it's always that awkward, like, bro, how do you how do you know me? Like, what? How, why are you talking to me? Am I in danger right now? <laughs> so yeah, you were in danger. I, I came to attack <laughs> you. And what what was weird also is like it's one of these situations where like. Like you and I, we create things, but I'm speaking to you inside of a gallery setting. Right. So, and it's, I don't know the gallery owner. This is not a knock towards her. I literally have no idea who she was, but she comes up and starts talking to me like I'm interested in the work. And I was, but I was more interested in like you and like how you made it. Right. And she's just like, oh, you know, Jeremy. I'm like, okay, that's fine. I'm trying to talk to him right now. Yeah, nah, I get it. It's, it's definitely like it's tough when you don't know who's who in those spaces. Cause it's just, yeah, it's so frantic and so many people are just moving so quickly. Um, so you, you kind of have to be uh, like, I've been in some galleries uh, in those type of situations where they don't get up at all. They don't talk to you at all. They don't make you feel welcome at all. And then other ones, um, they're like more aggressive with the, this might be a sale. Let me jump on it now. So yeah. Yeah. I've, I've been in both ways where I'm like, eh. I think it's just the nature of the beast of what, what Basel is sometimes. No, I think it's good. They're being proactive. You know, they don't know who I was. Like Fact, I could have yeah. been a buyer, you know, so right. I think it's good. They're, they're trying to promote you. Um, for everyone listening, the painting that you had on display there was very, very big. It's called Guapo and Robin. Yep. Uh, for people watching this, I'm going to put an image up of it, but maybe you just want to kind of talk about what that piece was. Yeah. So um, I started a series back in 2022 um, that was about, just taking up space. Um, there's a lot of times where, uh, you know, black people specifically are asked to shrink ourselves in every step of the way, whether it be the way we wear our hair to, um, you know, people calling it unprofessional or um, just basically asking us to change who we are to make them more comfortable. And so um, I started a series that was about taking up space and not shrinking for anyone. And so I wanted the pieces to be physically large, uh, but I wanted the, uh, the energy in those pieces to feel large as well. So um, that piece specifically was six foot by eight foot. Uh, it's one of the larger oil paintings I've done. And I just picked people in my life that were, if you move through the world in a world that's asking you to shrink yourself and you're being extra anyway, that's an act of defiance. And so uh, I just reached out to people that I know in my life that like I said, are, are extra ass people and was like, yo, I think you'd make a dope painting. And so um, yeah. they came in, we shot some reference photos here in my studio. And then, um, yeah, one of my favorite parts of that piece is the reflection of me taking the photo in Robin's glasses. Um, Cause you could see like that moment of what my studio looked like at that time. So I, I thought it was a dope like way to capture, like kind of like a time capsule of, I can, even for me, I can look at that piece and remember exactly you know, what the studio looked like, where I was, what junk was on the floor in the studio that day. Cause like I said, I painted all of it. So, um, yeah, yeah. That's, that's one of my favorite parts for sure. Cool. That series is called defiant, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. And I know you did a show and we'll talk about that later. Um, actually you just brought up a good point. So like the painting that we're talking about six by eight feet, I don't know the dude that was in it, but like, what's that like? Do those people, are those people weird after you paint it? Because like <laughs> you said, they're just people, you know, in your life, like it's not like a famous person or right. like a celebrity or it's just people, you know, which is cool. But then like, are they like, do I get that painting? Are they like right. weird about it? Nah, no one's ever been weird yet. Uh, I'm sure my luck was, is bound to run out at some point. Uh, people typically are more honored than they are weirded out by it. And so uh, I typically try to, to get everyone, if I can't, Obviously, they're not going to get the original, but I try to make like a high, um, a high 
resolution uh, canvas print for them so that, you know, it feels like they have the original, even if it's at a smaller uh, scale, because the reality of it is most people can't fit a six foot by eight foot painting in their homes like not even the richest people have walls that are big enough uh typically so or if they do they they have it, other stuff on that wall so usually i try to give them something that's a little bit smaller um for their for their own collection uh but as Got far it. as like seeing themselves in the piece like i never really show anyone that i'm painting the piece until they see it on the wall uh either in a gallery setting or like an open studio setting um so mm -hmm. since most of the people um that I painted for Basel weren't going to Miami. We did an open studio here, so they got to come by and uh, check out the pieces before they they shipped to Miami. So I, that's part of my process that I really enjoy is is watching people's reactions to the to seeing themselves in that way. Has anyone ever been like, "Oh, I don't like this"? Uh, not yet. I have. I've had family members of people um, say they didn't like it, but never the person that I really. Met. Why? What, what happened? People are just like they have their ideals of what they want stuff to be. And so, um, and, and it's their loved ones. So of course they're going to be hypercritical of yeah. you know, their nose isn't right or, or that doesn't look like them. So it's the nature of what it is. It, yeah, I like, used to, back in the day I used to shoot uh, weddings, like do photography at weddings and mm -hmm. it's no different than, you know, the bride and groom are extremely happy with, with the result, but it's always the one, the aunt or or grandmother that's just like like I said they love that person so of course they're gonna be like they have a vision of what they that person is so yeah I've learned to kind of mitigate that 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 feeling that's funny because like I imagine I mean I don't know you like I said but I imagine like you're a much better painter now than you were like say like five six years ago so oh, like. Sure. Because you're painting people, there probably was some early work that was kind of janky. I'm just guessing. Oh, I don't absolutely. know. But... No, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <there was. laughs> yeah, I look back and like I was talking to my wife about it and I was just like, I, there were times when I look at work that I was really, really proud of five, six, ten years ago. And mm -hmm. I look at it now and I'm like, yeah, no wonder no gallery wanted to to touch that. That was terrible. Like it was like it was good for what it was, but it still wasn't at the level of, you know, where things are now. So obviously I, I read a quote a long time ago that like, if you look back at work from five, six, seven uh, years ago and you don't cringe, you haven't grown enough since the last time you made that piece. Um, so yeah, I love that. I love that you said that. Cause I, yeah. I mean that I fully agree that you should always be trying to get better. Yeah. Like no 100%. matter what. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. That's cool. Um, I'm glad you brought up the idea of like most people can't, fit a six by eight foot painting in their house because like that comes up a lot you know even if you're wealthy especially in, in asian countries where i've noticed that their homes are much smaller so they really can't fit anything but being an artist and trying to sustain a living off of your work like why why are you making these so big i i understand from the defined standpoint and like making something big i get that but like from a like I, get, I don't want to use the word business when we're talking about the defiant thing, but right. like, I mean, obviously you're making this really big, but then you're like, it's going to take a very special person to be able to fit this. So like, what's your mentality there? Yeah. Um, so I was doing a lot of paintings that were like more medium sized paintings, uh, things that were, um, you know, 18 by 24 up till, you know, 36 by 48 or, or 48 by 50 or sorry, 48 by 60. Um, and those were moving and they were doing well and, and it was fine, but I wasn't getting the traction that I kind of felt like I was seeing other people, you know, my peers getting. And so uh, it got to a point where I, I felt slighted a little bit by like the museum situation or the gallery situation. And so um, part of it was the defiance of taking up space and like physically taking up space on a wall. Um, but also it was about like proving that, I belong in that that conversation with some of my peers and some of the people that were getting these looks that I felt like I'm not gonna, I'm not one of those people that feel like I deserved that you should have given it to me. Uh, that's just not who yeah. I am. But um, I at least wanted to you know have the consideration, and I felt like I wasn't even getting the consideration. And so um, it was more of me like I played basketball my entire life up until my daughter was born, and so I'm a borderline unhealthily competitive person. Um, and so it was very much me trying to like prove and in a competitive way, like I have what it takes and 
I tried to make works that were just so undeniable that it was an indictment on the people not taking it more than it was an indictment on my work. So, um, so then I started doing pieces that were like super huge and with the expectation that it wasn't going to move or it wasn't going to sell just to prove a point. And, um, that was the fourth one that size and two of those have sold. So it was like a, that's cool. Um, and I love that for sure. Um, but my intention was always the, just to prove that I could do the work, um, that side. Got it. So. I mean, man, my opinion doesn't fucking matter to anybody, but like when you're walking through Basel and you're literally seeing a thousand pieces of work and like yours is the one I stopped at. Right. I mean, <clears throat> it's really good. I mean, I mean, it, the, the background color was pink. So that kind of stood right. out. I love the dots. I love just the contrast of how painterly the character was contrasted with those those pop art dots right for sure. and then i then i went home and i looked at your instagram so i didn't know you until i started speaking to you there and i go to right. your instagram like oh this guy does a lot of fucking dots like then i find out it's about when your mother passed right mm -hmm. yep so what's if you don't mind what's the story there yeah so uh my mom passed in 2007 and um uh, when she passed a ladybug landed on or near me that entire like week that we were planning her funeral um i would go you know i was back at work um, and I worked on the seventh floor of an office building and I was finding ladybugs like in the building on like crawling on the window or I would just find them in just the most random places. And so, um, it got to, I was like, okay, well I can start utilizing that and putting that in my work. And so I started hiding ladybugs on the work. So I would hide it on the back of the canvas, on the side of the panel. Um, and it would be like a realistic life-size ladybug just so there's pieces of mine, like early works that um, that people have ladybugs just on them. And I don't know if they've ever found them. I wanted it to be a feeling of the same feeling that I had in terms of you could have lived with this piece in your home for years and then you move it or move it to a different wall or whatever. And then you find this ladybug. And so um, it got to a point where I was painting so many ladybugs and I didn't feel like it was adding anything or sometimes the subject matter that I was painting didn't warrant a ladybug. And so, and I started doing more corporate gigs at that same time. And so I just didn't have the heart of, you know, if I'm doing a poster for Coke or Nike or whoever, and I add a ladybug and they're like, we love it, but take that ladybug off. Um, and so I was like, how can I paint a ladybug in every piece without necessarily painting a ladybug in every piece? And I was like, well, ladybugs are basically just a collection of dots. And I went to school for graphic design and I was like, all right, so let's distill it down to its most basic shapes. And that became something that I could use as more of like a graphic element as well as a narrative tool in the work. And so then the dots were just like something that was more identifiable that I could do no matter what the subject matter was, no matter what the color palette was, no matter uh, what the shape of the canvas was, I could do that. And even in the like the mural work that I do, the studio practice, like it was something that I could take across all my different practices um, and and make it mine. So uh, it became a thing. Um, and I still to this day get people that are just like, yo, I love this painting, but I like, why'd you ruin it with those dots? Why'd you co like cover it with the dots? Um, and so it, it kind of was also, which I think is going to be an underlying theme for this entire conversation is me like bucking the system and being like, nah, like because you don't like it is why I'm doing it more. Um, yeah. I painted it once I can paint it again. And so I usually add the dots after the painting. And so a lot of people see the process of me adding the dots after the painting is basically done. And mm -hmm. like I said, some of the dots will cover like key parts of it, uh, of the piece, just because that's just happens to be where the pattern fell. Um, and so, like I said, it's part that's of just great. that, like, yeah, part of the story, but also the, the rebellion of because it pisses you off. I'm going to do it more. <laughs> No, I love that. Just do yeah. a painting of one big dot. Yeah. Um, no, I, I mean, dude, not to not to sound like rude, but like I think if that if that painting Guapo and Robin didn't have the dots, I would have been like, all right, it's just a painting of some yeah. guy. I don't really care. Yeah, for you sure. Know, I, for I, sure. I, I mean, it makes it yours, I think. And yeah. I think that's and then when there's a story behind it, it's like, oh, OK, this is why I should pay attention to this artist, I think. I mean, that's just my opinion. No, I agree. I Like I said, I've. I've used it in different ways up to this point and and I like the fact that it plays with like the foreground and the middle ground and the background like like I said with me having a, a background in photography um 
being able to shoot my own references and then control that much of the work, I think also drives home the fact that like it is mine. And so it's not like nothing I do is like left to chance. Uh, it's yeah. usually like really thought out. And um, like I said, being able to play with a topography, especially when you paint realism, like it get, it can kind of get boring uh, to your point. So I try to do things that kind of engage the viewer and, and activate the the surface a little bit more. So if you see it online, like you have one experience versus if you see it in person, it's a different experience. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Do you, um, do you have help in your studio or are you doing everything yourself? Nope. Just me. Um, technically, Jesus. yeah, it's, it's a lot. Um, technically it's my wife and I, my wife is an artist as well and we share a studio. So, um, if I do need an extra hand on something, then, you know, and same vice versa for her work. Like if, if she needs a hand or if I need a hand, we, we basically just lend each other that hand, but yeah, but aren't Typically, you guys completely just, different? She does rugs, right? Yeah, she does uh, like tufted wall hanging, like rug stuff. Yeah, so it's okay. It's 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 more of a like I said, she has she went to school for graphic design. She has a degree in in design as well. So we we both just we can bounce ideas off of each other, but also like if we just physically need a hand, like lifting something onto a wall or got it, like whatever, like we help each other do those things. But typically, it's us in the studio solo. Got it. Got it. What's Sam Io? Is that who? Uh, Sam Lau. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I just okay. No, no, no. Sam it's, Lau. There you go. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Her work's great, man. I found it this morning because I was just like looking through your stuff, just trying to like think of more things to ask you, and I'm like, holy shit, this is awesome. Yeah, I love I her work. She's her on sometime. She, well, I hope yeah, you love her work. Could you imagine if you didn't? You'd be in a yeah. lot of trouble. Yeah, no, facts. I I tell her all the time she's one of my favorite artists, but she always is like, you're supposed to say that. Like, you're you're my husband. You're married to me. You don't have a choice, but I genuinely yeah. do believe like she's one of my favorite artists, like her, her use of color, her use of texture, uh, all of those things are like, That's I come right. into the studio because of how our studio schedule is, is scheduled. Uh, we're basically here at the studio every other day. And so I'll come in to, to projects that she's working on and definitely I'll see something. And I'm like, yo, I need to borrow that color palette. Like that's like, yeah. that's super hard. Uh, and like, because yeah. our work is so different, um, you know, it's not something that's going to be, you know, stepping on toes if, if we do those types of things. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's that like uh, working so closely beside your wife, who's an artist? Like most couples, like my girlfriend, like she literally just left for the day, but right. she is not an artist, she does something completely different. She's gone, but like you're, you're at home and you guys get in a fight about you ate the last slice of cheese out of the fridge or something. <laughs> and then you go work and she's fucking there. But like, you still eat that goddamn cheese. Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're like, we're really good about like communicating with each other. And, and mm -hmm. we both are, um, it's really important relationship wise, uh, not to go too far down the, make this a relationship podcast, but we both are very thoughtful and mindful not to like keep score and try to like hang shit over each other's heads. Um, mm -hmm. And so we have a pretty healthy, like, pretty healthy relationship pretty healthy communication so we just talk about stuff that bothers us in real time and don't let it fester until we like resent each other and so Got when it. it comes to like studio practice stuff as well as just life in general um we do have our disagreements for sure and it's because we both feel like what we're doing or our opinion on it we have you know we have reasons for making those decisions or we have reasons for feeling the way we feel but at the end of the day we both look at each other and just like I value your opinion, but you're wrong about this. So I don't want to hear anything else about it. Um, not, not necessarily like a man in a relationship. Yeah. Nah, that's, that's more her to me, actually. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, like we're both, uh, um, we know each other, like we've been together forever. So we know mm -hmm. our triggers. We know what things are like, kind of how to be more tactful with, with our critique or our uh, advice. Um, but at the end of the day, we both know that it's, you know, our own careers and we're individuals. So you do what you want to do. And, and our famous saying is like, yo, live your life. Like if it's something that we don't agree with or you're going to yeah. do it anyway, then we're just like, yo, live your life. Like this is yours to do with what you want to do. Um, you know, that's, that's your thing. If it, if it doesn't work out, like, I'm not going to be like, ah, I told you so, ha ha ha, whatever. Cause we try to treat everything. Like even with our daughter, like we treat it as more of a team uh, than it is like a competition in the house. Cause we're always like, yo, the rest of the world is going to do an amazing job of beating you up when you leave the house. The goal of, at the house is to, you know, lift each other up and and keep each other like 
you know, in a positive mindset. So it, it's all about That's great. like protecting each other when we're at the house. And then, like I said, the rest of the world does a great job of kicking your ass. So we don't need to yeah. do that at the house too. So um, we try to keep it and it helps to have a studio um, because we can keep the work shit at work. And then the house stuff is just, you know, us chilling on the couch, watching TV. We don't typically like, unless we have crazy ass deadlines, which any artist can you know attest to, but we try to keep, the art and work life stuff at the studio and not bring it to the house if we can. That's good. I think that's, that, that's very good. You guys are in Dallas. Yep. Dallas. Yep. What's, what's the art community like there? What's, I mean, most people, we always hear about Austin. I mean, right. from outside of Texas. Right. What's Dallas like? Um, Dallas is, it has its moments of where it could be really cool. It could be a world-class like art city, it could be a world-class city in general. Um, but it does, it goes out of its way to kind of stifle itself. Uh, and so that, that's the the nice way of putting it. The community of artists. Um, it, well. Dallas does things like a prime example is a few years back. Um, there was a little bubbling of a culture happening where things were starting to finally get traction and people were starting to get looks and shows were happening and events were happening. Like it was, it was going crazy, like finally to a point where it was getting nuts. And then the fire marshal took issue with that for whatever reason. And so he just started showing up to events uh, and shutting them down at like when they got to their peak to kind of make an example out of people. Um, Great, and he would perfect. shut, shut things down for like your mirror is two inches too high in the bathrooms. You have to shut down until you get that fixed or like little goofy shit like that, where it became a point where people just stopped doing events because literally the fire marshal would just sit on Facebook or sit on Instagram um, and, and just make a, you know, a document of all these events that were happening um, and would just show up just to shut them down. So people stopped doing events. Why? We still don't know. We like, everybody has theories about why it happened, but no one actually knows. It just, just like mad and bored and old or what? Yeah. Like, like I said, we don't know, like I said, I don't want to speculate cause whatever, but it, it definitely mm -hmm. was like little goofy shit like that would always happen. Uh, but the community of artists is amazing. The, the actual artists, uh, that are here are some of the most talented people in the world, but because we are a middle of the country market, it's kind of like, even though I always like to call Dallas a, a huge small town, um, it's it's obviously not LA. It's obviously not New York. It's obviously not Miami or Chicago. So it has trouble having confidence in being who it is. And so it always like, it won't show love. And I, this isn't a mutually Dallas problem, but it won't show love to its locals um, and the people that are doing things until someone else co-signs it. So if, you know, if, if I do a show it's in every LA, small city, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, that's so, pretty common. Yeah, so it, it it Dallas is the same in that way for sure, um, and it's just it's unfortunate because, like I said, I have a lot of friends here that are really really talented artists that could compete globally, but they just never get the looks just because the powers that be, whoever, whatever it is that's happening here, like Dallas doesn't like figurative work, for example, um, and. It's just, like I said, it, it, there's a lot of things. Like, we would be here talking for days, talking about all the the things yeah. that, that Dallas is. But um, it, it's just tough. It's growing and it, it's moving uh, positively, but it's not moving fast enough. Like, it, it's kind of like anytime something starts bubbling too quickly, something comes in to kind of rein it back a little bit. And so it, it's really frustrating, especially... You know, it's basically like a citywide gaslight uh, situation where it's like you look at your work and you're like, yo, I know I can compete. I know the work that I'm making is strong. I know the work that I'm making is, you know, something that could be in these spaces. Um, but, you know, even with like the work you saw at Basel, like this is the type of work I've been making for at least the last three or four years, um, mm -hmm. maybe even longer at that same level, at that same caliber. And it wasn't until last year that I got like my first Dallas gallery show. Um, and like, I've done show like official Dallas gallery shows. Like I've done shows here and there, like, you know, other type, you know, store, like galleries that are also furniture stores or uh, galleries that are only open on Saturday, you know, like Saturday evening yeah. and stuff like that. But as far as like the main uh, galleries here in Dallas, like, like I said, it wasn't until 
I want to say twenty, the beginning of twenty twenty two, when I first got that first uh, gallery show. Well, how much? Sorry if you don't want to answer this. Like I said, we can always take this out if you want. But how yeah. much was was that the Guapo and Robin painting? Just for to remind everybody, six by eight feet. Mm -hmm. It's 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 a guy that most people never met, don't know who they are. Right. How much was that painting? Uh, that one was thirty eight thousand. Something like okay, that. Okay. So okay. Yeah. Fair. I agree that, that that's a good price, but I think that's a good price. But where you live in Dallas, who's buying that? Right. So and I don't mean are, that as a knock on no, anybody, but like sure, it's small, sure. it's small, it's small city like pricing. Yeah, no, for sure. So it's it's definitely there's very there's very few people that can afford a thirty eight thousand dollar painting. Um and yeah. I recognize that. And and that's anywhere, not just Dallas. Like there's very few people anywhere that can afford that. And so it's the my collectors are people that you know they have obviously money to spend on that type of stuff and so um typically mm -hmm. what i try to do is make work that is at a more i try to kind of delineate two different ways um some of the work that i do obviously is going to be more um like gallery specific works and so it's going to be priced at a certain point but then the other stuff that i'm trying to get directly to the consumer and not go through like the gallery route or go through the more fine art side of things like um some of the spray cans that were there at uh at basel i take some of the the empty spray cans that i have from murals that i've done and paint on those as originals and keep the price point like spend maybe an hour or less on each of them so that the price point can be as low as possible um, to get originals in people's hands that are regular people because the reality of it is there's far more regular people that can buy a lower price point art piece than there are people that can afford a $38,000 piece. And so oh, yeah. um, being able to kind of touch both of those markets is something that has been really important in my career up to this point. And so it's something that I try to, you know, obviously with the, uh, the the more my career grows, the the harder it is to do those and harder it is to justify doing those. Um, but it is something that is important because I know, you know, what it feels like to not have, you know, income to be able to spend on art and original art and you fall in love with the piece and you just can't get the piece because um, you just, like I said, you just have to eat and you have to pay it. rent and you can't, you, you have to do all these other things. And so yeah. um, I try to, to not ostracize the people that got me to where I am in my career at this point, like the people that were buying works when they knew they couldn't afford it, when they were making a decision between my piece and eating or my piece and the lights. Um, so I don't want to just ostracize those people by completely pricing them out. And so, like I said, it's just something that's just been important to me um, to be able to at least once a year, maybe not all the time, but at least once a year offer something to, to, um, to every price point. Got it. The, the the gallery you're showing with at Basel, where are they based out of? Uh, they're based in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Yeah. Okay, got it. How did you meet them? Um, I met them at Basel last year, actually. Um, I okay. A friend of mine, a, a mutual friend of ours, Clarence Hayward, um, is represented by San, uh, Turner Carroll in Santa Fe. And he was like, yo, I really want you to meet my gallerist. I think that you guys would do really well together. They sell my work like crazy. And he and I do similar things. His work is, um, he paints portraits, but in like a green shade. Uh, so it's usually like him and okay. his family in a green shade. Um, and like I said, he was like, yo, they do a really great time selling my, my works. And so I think they would do the same for you. Um, okay. we were literally the last, I don't know, 10 minutes of art Miami last year. Um, uh, we pulled up, we knew they were about to close, uh, we flew out the next morning, and so we were like, we have to go introduce ourselves. It's been a hectic week, but we have to make this happen. And so we drove over, valeted, hopped out, got inside. Uh, they literally were announcing that they were shutting it down, and everybody had to walk out as we were introducing ourselves. But uh, mm -hmm. we met them, and basically they – I was showing at – during Basel Art Week last year at Prism uh, Fair. And so I had work for them to see that was there. Um, I told them about it. They were like, all right, we're going to try to come make it by before the fair opens tomorrow. And they actually went by and checked it out, got to see it in person. And then I saw them again at the Dallas Art Fair uh, in April and reached out and walked up and was like, hey, 
Good to see you guys again. Just wanted to reconnect because I, I, it was such a quick meeting at Basel last year that I knew they didn't remember me. And so uh, I just wanted to, like I said, just be in the way long enough that, like I said, they they saw me basically. Um, and yeah, once we we talked at uh, Dallas Art Fair last year, um, they were like, wait, you guys are based in Dallas. Can we come by the studio and do a studio visit? And so they came by like the very next day, stayed for a few hours and we're like, all right, we move pretty quickly. We want to represent you and your wife. Let's uh, let, let's make this happen right now. And so they literally, they were like, we have a van driving back to Santa Fe tomorrow. We would like to take everything that you'll allow us back to Santa Fe with us. And so they came literally the next morning after that, took every single piece that we had. And um, then, like I said, December, we're, we're here uh, at Basel. So yeah, yeah it, Jesus. Was, it was, it was a crazy quick uh, move, but definitely something that my wife and I, we were like, yo, whenever it happens, we got to be ready for it. So, um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it was definitely, definitely good times for sure. Got it. Are they selling your work? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's moving. So I'm not mad. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Um, let's move on. Let's talk about your artsy fartsy high school you went to. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do Booker it. Booker T. Washington. Yeah. High school for performing visual arts. Yep. So yeah, it was, what was that like? It was everything you would imagine it to be. Um, like everybody always compares it to, this is a super antiquated reference nowadays. Um, they compare it to uh, Fame, the old show from like the 60s or 70s, 80s. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it's very much, I guess the more common or I guess the more recent reference would be like High School Musical. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's very much that. Um, you know, you have students singing in the hallway because the they built the building for the acoustics. And so you would have people just like on the upper floor singing. And so it just sounded like angelic chorus uh, from above. So mm -hmm. it, it definitely, it's some of my fondest memories for sure. The, the school is phenomenal. Um, it, it, a lot of people went to this school, like Erica Badu graduated from that school. Michael Reeder, uh, was there when I was there. Um, like there's a lot of people, Nora Jones, like a lot of people that went to this school and, um, it, it was cool. It was, it was super dope to, to be there and be amongst like every single student in that school is a creative and so yeah. to, to have that that type of energy around you at all times uh you know Must be amazing. In, it was amazing it was phenomenal even when you're in like history class or or algebra like these people are still artists and so being able yeah. to be around that energy like literally all four years of high school was how was absolutely how amazing. do you how do you get into a school like that like <clears throat> did your parents uh like apply for you to go there or is it just like you were recognized and chosen like i have no frame of reference how that kind of stuff works i went to like a normal everyday peasant high school right yeah it's it was <laughs> it was cool um the definitely the um the process to get in was you had to audition what whatever that meant for whether you were a dancer whether you're an actor whether you're a musician uh for mm -hmm. us visual artists we had to um, they sat us in a room, all everybody that was trying to apply, they sat us in a room to draw a still life, um, you know, over the course of like an hour. They had us do a like word test. I don't even remember what the written part of the test was. And then they had us sculpt uh, some stuff out of clay for like an hour. And based on what you did in that three hour, you know, process or interview, you either got in or you didn't. And so, uh, um, that must've been really nerve wracking. Oh, it was super nerve wracking. I'm, I'm an eighth grader like, that have never yeah. been through an interview before. Um, you know, my extent of my art knowledge at that point was my mom stealing reams of, of copy paper from work and bringing them home uh, for me to draw on. And so, um, yeah. I didn't know, like, you know, I didn't know how to sit on a drawing horse. I didn't know how to clip my paper to the, the board, like stuff that, you know, other kids that were in this audition process, they've had private tutors since they were three. And so um, it, it definitely was a you can size yourself up and kind of see like how you stack up. But it, mm -hmm. it was super nerve wracking. Like it was one of the most nerve wracking. Like I still now think about it. And I'm like, yeah, that shit was tough. Um, so I mean, you got in, though. Like you I did. mean, yeah, I, I definitely I don't know how I got in because how many like kids said, did you graduate with? One hundred and forty four. 
How many do you think went on to be like a full time working artist? Ooh, um, you can guess. Yeah, so I graduated 144 in the entire senior class. So that's including visual art, dance, music, and acting. There's probably 30 of like 20 to 30 of us that were uh, visual artists in that graduating class. So I would say maybe, man, um, yeah, I don't know, like maybe five, five or six of us. Okay. So yeah, got it. Yeah, you said you said reader, right? Reader, yeah. Reader's been on the podcast before. Yeah. Yeah. He, he's very well spoken about art. He's very uh, heady about his work, which is oh, absolutely, cool. absolutely. Um, do you do you stay in touch with those kids? Like, what's what's like? Are you like in a little artist bubble where you live? What like like I have like a couple artists that I s- spend a lot of time with here. We bounce ideas off each other. Is it is it like that there? Um, yeah, for sure. Um, it, it definitely like we have the the homies that you know that we all hang out with that are uh, where my studio is is in a part of town where there's a lot of like, it's become basically like the artist part of town, like the, where everybody's studios are. Um, Mm -hmm. And so like reader is two buildings over Dan lamb is like two, like a block over uh, on the corner up there. And so um, there's a lot of like people that are here, like Rizzy JM Rizzy is like two doors down to on the other direction. So there's a lot of people that are all here. And so it's like, anytime we need to just bounce over and just be like, Hey, take a look at this. Hey, what do you think of this? Let me ask you this. Um, and so it's really cool to have everyone here. Um, but all at the same time, we're all so busy that it, there's very few times where we can get out and go talk to each other in that. Yeah, I get you. Like we usually see each other at like open studios or at yeah. you know, gallery openings or, but, um, we're usually all like nose to the grindstone, head down, just like grinding it out, trying to make shit happen. Yeah. So um, it's not like we're all just like a frat house where we just pop in and everybody's doors are just open. And we just. That's what everyone th- assumes that we all do. Like we're just like taking drugs and painting when we feel like it. And it's yeah. not like that at all. Yeah, no, not like at we're all. working 23 hours a day. Yeah. I just had Dan Lamb on the, the podcast. She didn't start work, she said, till like one in the afternoon, which I thought. Oh, yeah. Dan works. It's wild. Yeah, Dan is is a trip. Like she, yeah, she's the most yeah. scheduled person that like I maybe know. Like she's everything is so structured. Um, like even when you go to her studio, like it it doesn't look like a studio space. Like it it looks like a storefront almost because it's just so oh, really? well kept and so like she's nice. so organized. Um, but it yeah, it, it's definitely it's cool to to have those people just like right here to just bounce ideas off of and just be like, yo, what do you think of this contract? Yeah. How do you feel about this? Like, yeah, totally. Yeah, no, that's, that's good awesome. that you have those people. And like, they're, those are good people to have around. Like, Oh yeah. Just 100%. other people who are like in the scene, like doing things. That's great. Um, I was going to ask you about your solo show, Defiant. We kind of touched on it. Yeah. Um, is there anything else maybe we could talk about? Like how many pieces did you have? That was last year you did that show. That was in Dallas, right? Yep, it was here in Dallas at Nation Board Gallery. It was fourteen pieces. Um, How long did you work on it for? Um, it was the longest I had ever worked on a show. Like typically, up to that point, um, I basically carved out like the month and a half before the show uh, to to mm-hmm. carve out the work because uh, I paint pretty quickly. But this was the first show that I was like, "All right, if I'm going to make a statement as big as I want to make the statement, I have to." spend more time with the works and and make like i said make the work so undeniable that even if you don't get a you know a museum show out of this or even if it doesn't get collected by whatever then it's it's still like like i said the work is so undeniable that you did what you were supposed to do and so yeah um, do you feel I like started, you did? yeah absolutely i think i accomplished what i was you know what i sought out to do i think the I want to say I, I spent about six months uh, working on the the works, um, and then for sure one of the pieces that I did that was like the title image for the the show, um, Maddie, was like the longest I've ever spent on a painting. Like like I said, I typically knock out a painting in like a week or two. Especially that size is usually like two weeks to to three, but that piece took like three months of me working eight to 12 hours a day 
um, almost every single day because <laughs> it was just, like I said, it was the most ambitious painting I'd ever tried at that point. And mm-hmm. it, I mean, like I said, it was the first piece that I ever sold for that much. So it was, it, it did what it was supposed to do for sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so, and it definitely got the attention of some, some local museums here. So, yeah. So it did what it was supposed to do. I sold the works and it got the attention of who I was trying to get the attention of. So. Fair enough. Um, I also read you did a residency this year. Yeah. I did a residency in true? Denver. Yeah. It was cool. How long um, was it? It was only 10 days. Um, so it was a okay. shorter, shorter residency. Uh, but yeah, it was in Denver. Um, at the beginning of the year, like January. So I was in Denver in the cold and, you know, coming from Texas, God. going to Denver in January. Did you freeze to death? Oh my God. No, I enjoyed it actually. I, I like the okay. cold weather because, you know, being in Dallas, we get snow. Well, it used to be once every five years. Now it's like once every year, but um, mm-hmm. shout out climate change. Uh, we, being in Denver in January was like, I was actually looking forward to it. And everybody that was there the whole time I was there was like apologizing for the the snow. And I was like, yo, I would have been disappointed if I was in Denver in January and it wasn't snow on the ground. Like I would have been super bummed. I'm like, yeah. yo, I left Dallas for the same type of way. Like, no, I need, I need snow. I need the, the threat of falling and busting my ass. Like I need all of that uh, to have the full Denver experience. And so, yeah, um, it was cool. It was a cool experience. Uh, it had its challenges. Um, I, I, the original plan was to the, the space that they gave us or gave me was a old storefront that, uh, was basically underground under this building with other storefronts on top of it. And I was going to fill the entire space with a mural, like edge to edge, the whole wall, um, do this, this huge ass mural. Uh, but there's two restaurants that also were in that building and, it's January in, you know, single digit weather. So I couldn't open the bay door. So all the fumes from the spray paint, all the restaurant people were coming over and were complaining. Complaining. And so, um, I had to, to bail on that halfway through basically. And so on day six of a 10 day mural, I had to basically scrap what I was doing and come up with something else. And so I just did a couple of like large scale acrylic paintings and then one of the last things I want to just, you know, talk to you about, I usually wrap this up the same way with a lot of guests. It's just, you obviously, you live in a, not a major city, but you're still making moves. You're still, you know, getting to Basel, selling paintings, doing murals, all kinds of stuff. Any advice you might have to a younger artist that may be watching this and just wondering how to kind of get started, kind of how to start selling their work? Yeah. Um, the easiest answer is to just do the work and make it happen um i know that sounds like an oversimplification and it's it's definitely is to an extent but i think making work that you want to make more of uh, a lot of times people try to replicate what they see or what they feel is successful um and i think the thing that more often than not just making work that feels true to you that you want to make more of there's nothing worse than um, um there's nothing worse than when you are making work that you think people want to see and you hate making it. And then you get, you know, God forbid you start popping off really making that type of work and you hate making it. So, um, I just tell people just continue to make, uh, make stuff. And then also the other bit of advice that I always give people is no matter how put together someone seems, everybody, you know, everybody you've ever met, your parents, your teachers, um, other artists, like everybody is making that shit up as they go. Everybody is freestyling. Um, They're just trying to figure it out and do what makes sense for them in that moment. And so, like I said, as long as you're being authentic to yourself and being like really, really uh, honest with yourself, like almost brutally honest with yourself about where you are, where you stack up uh, with the rest of of what you're trying to do, then like I said, you can, you can live with that at the end of the day. And so, realizing that there's no pressure because all of this shit is made up. Like it's all just, like I said, no matter what person seems to be an expert on it is, it's just, they're taking their experiences or other people's experiences that they've read about and making an opinion about something. And just because they do that for a living doesn't mean that they're an expert or that they're an authority on the thing. So 
um, just remembering that and just making the work that you want to make is is the biggest thing. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we're done. Is there anything you want to talk about before we hang up? Um, nah, I think that's it. That's All right. Good. Well, fine then. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, uh, well, thanks so much, Jeremy. I appreciate it. And yeah, I, man, it's, thank good you. To, it's good to talk to you and great work. I mean, I don't, this is the first time I've ever just saw someone's work in, in real life. It's like, okay, we have to do a podcast. Like, I was just so impressed. So <laughs> nice. it's I great to uh, talk yeah. to you. Yeah, yeah you, you too. Appreciate you. Awesome. Dude. Well, I'll talk to you next time. Thanks so much. All right, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. All right. Bye. All right, everybody, I hope you enjoyed that. You know, maybe you have questions or opinions about what we talked about on this episode. Maybe you have your own questions about your art career or are just looking for some advice. Shoot us an email and we'll answer your questions on a future episode. You can email us directly on our website, cleanbreakpodcast.com. And just a reminder that all our past episodes are available there, as well as a ton of free resources, guides, and tips on how to make more money with your art and get more people interested. This podcast is produced by Elijah Walsh, theme song by Ditch David, additional research by Ikram Dadar. I want to thank Patrick, Jason, and the Always Art team. My name is Matt Gondek. I'll crash you next time.